Dero, hello. Uh, thank you for joining this evening, this roundtable organized by CSR LAS, ILDO, and Equilibrium Institute um, about the role of sustainability education and certification. Um, as most of you know, a responsible sustainable business can, um, can not only attract more customers, investors, but it can build trust and increase its um, and have its uh, social license to operate. Um, the aim of this roundtable will be to exchange views on um, some certification and education initiatives um, that have been implemented by different organizations. But to start by setting the frame of the round table, I will give the floor to Mr. Dan Oki by Deloitte UK, uh, who will talk about the findings of um, the most recent um, report they published uh, about the Chief Sustainability Officer. Mr. Oki, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, um... I'm very happy to, to talk through the results of, of the recent research. If we can move on to the, to the first slide, please. There we go, okay. So recently, Deloitte uh, ran a survey of around about 80 financial um, service companies uh, and, uh, and banks, asking them why they had a CSO, a Chief Sustainability Officer, and why they did not. And I think it's really useful to, to share this research because it shows you, I think, what the mandate for sustainability roles is, and therefore what the skills are that are required to deliver that mandate. But first of all, for some background, we asked um, our, our panel, why do some firms have a CSO and others don't? And the ones that said they did have a CSO or did have a big sustainability function, said that the first main reason was that the, the external world was, travel was changing much more quickly than the internal parts of the company which isn't necessarily always the case. It could be that you're a big tech firm and you're innovating much more quickly than the external environment. But, but um, as I'm sure, as we all know, in, in a month, things happen in the sustainability space, which change, change um, what's going on. So that's why you need um, somebody dedicated to this because the external world is changing so quickly. Secondly, the expectations on you in your business for, or your department, if you're a government, um, to adapt and to, and to embed sustainable thinking. Those expectations are really, really strong. And um, as we move into an era where stakeholders have more and more of, a, of an input into, into an organization's decisions, what stakeholders think about you becomes a key determinant of your strategy and, and of your success. So somebody who can act as a bridge between the, the external world and the internal decision-making processes of a company is, is, a, is a really vital um, uh, role to play. And, and most people in, in, in an in a, in a organization are busy doing their, their BAU job, their business as usual job. You don't have the time to, to focus on what's going on outside as well as what's going on inside. Uh, and thirdly, there, I think there is um, a recognition by many firms, uh, businesses, organizations, that the kinds of ESG risks that they are running are actually central to their long-term survival. Uh, and we have seen, I think, a, a shift in corporate planning timescales. The, the typical business plan might have looked three or five years ahead, but we know, looking at, at, a, at a carbon neutral targets, that we need to be thinking 30 years ahead, if not longer, in order to accurately capture the, the timeframes of, of, um, of the other decisions that need to be made. Um, so that's why I think you know, there's been a, um, a drive to, to recruit and appoint sustainability professionals within firms. Um, and then just to close off, the, the, the small number of people who didn't have um, um, a specialist sustainability professional within their firms, um, the reasons were largely not yet, but we think we're going to have one. We're simply too small. You know, we have 10 people. Or um, there is still some degree of, of board skepticism around the need for, for um, a CSO. So that I think these, these, these three drivers help to explain what the mandate of the role is. So if we go on to the next slide. If we can 
there we go. Um, so what is the mandate, yeah, for um, a chief sustainability officer? Um, and I should say that these results are basically, they're, they're, they're mostly centered on, on the financial services industry, but I think you can extrapolate them more broadly. Um, so the, the, the three things that we came up with as a, as, as a big mandate were to make sense of that rapidly changing external environment and to bring insight from outside the firm into the firm. And just as an, as an example, um, if you know that um, you're, across your industry, a certain um, um, practice is becoming widespread because of the expectation of a regulatory change that's going to impact, then you can bring that peer practice knowledge into the firm and say, look, it's, it's inevitable. We are going to have to do this. Let's start doing it now. And that's something, that's an insight that other people might not have. Secondly, uh, you're there to help the organization reconfigure its business strategy, its business model even, because the way they make money, the way they deploy capital, and if you're not a, if you're a government organization, the way that you spend your budget, the deployment of capital and the management of risks need to change. And that creates um, challenges across the whole of, 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 of the business operations because you have to rethink you know, what really is going to make this, this company um, create retained earnings now and into the future. And thirdly, uh, there is the need to provide thought leadership and help to get everybody else in that organization aligned and working together and, and synchronized um, in their philosophy, in their terminology, in their ambitions, in their targets, the metrics that they use and their priorities. So we often hear that the, that the chief sustainability officer or sustainability professionals join the dots in between very disparate firms, uh, parts of, of an organization, um, so that they, you know, that, 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 that um, they are consistent. So that your, for example, your policies on remuneration and bonuses and, and retention and recruitment are um, consistent with the, the, the new products that you're developing, which are consistent with um, how you risk manage and, and how you um, set up your, your businesses um, internally. So again, so we asked the question quite in, in a number of ways, what should the CSO prioritize? And you maybe can't quite see um, the, uh, the graphics there, but the, um, you know, that the, the, the four green dots are reconfigure the business model. Um, lower down were, um, were um, uh, compliance um, regulation and, 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 and data reporting. Um, and again, in the third chart, again, it shows the same thing. It's largely about strategy um, and influencing and less about compliance. Now, I should say at this point that um, the difference between uh, financial firms, like banks mainly, and, and other businesses is that a bank is exposed to every different sector. So it cannot be an expert in any one particular sector. But if you're a company that, that's in a particular sector, say, you know, um, consumer durables or um, services or something, then there will be specialist compliance and um, risk and reporting data that you would be expected to know. Okay, so the next slide, please, and the final one. So, okay, so we've, we've talked about what the mandate of the other role is. Um, joining the dots, um, bringing outside expertise and insight into the insight um, and, um, and I think the, the skills that are required to, to deliver those are, in a way, fairly straightforward. So this, the survey that we ran asked people to rank um, these, these 10 skills, 10 technical skills, and then four management skills. And I, I should say that although the, the top two, influencing and strategy, were really far away above um, at the top, Every one of those other ones was uh, was preferred by at least one of the survey respondents. So that suggests that you know that, that there's a wide variety of of configuration of the job um, across the industry. But if we think about it, so why is influencing and why is strategy? Why do they come out on top? I think it comes back to the desire of the of a firm to um, to um, to reach out to all of its parts, all of its operations, and and change the way that it does business. Um, yeah, that's in that. so communication skills, knowledge of your company become paramount. And then just to finally wrap up, because I'm one minute above my schedule. Um, in terms of management skills, uh, we found that all four faces of the management were needed. Sometimes you need to be agitating for change. 
Sometimes she needs to be facilitating other people to change. Sometimes you're a steward of, of a process. And other times you are actually doing things yourself. And there was no clear, clear um, bias in those. Okay, that's my seven minutes. Um, sorry I ran over, but uh, uh, I thought it's important to, to give a bit of context. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Okay, that was really very interesting. You you manage in seven minutes wrap up a whole report that gives a very good insight on exactly what the problem is. And I think um, you make a very good link to our next speaker, Mr. Collard from the Shifters, um, who um, some time ago published or will publish a report on how education can help incorporate sustainability in high school um, curricula. Uh, and Mr. Kola uh, will um, give a better, will um, present now his view on how the digital innovation, something that came uh, up during the COVID pandemic uh, period, um, can help promote uh, sustainability, education on sustainability. Mr. Kola, um, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Ms. Sini. <clears throat> yeah, I think indeed it's a great agenda for today. Um, so uh, as you know, Climate and environmental sustainability is gaining more and more attention amongst youth and, and students in particular, but not only. Uh, the European Union set up a clear target of carbon neutrality by 2050, and more and more companies and organizations are stepping uh, into sustainability as we just saw. So in view of this situation, we wanted to understand what is the current offering of courses and curricula in universities and more particularly, we wanted to know if the, the current offering is sufficient to address and fulfill the demand to come regarding skills, talent, expertise on climate and environmental sustainability. So um, to, to address that, that question, um, our methodology consisted in developing an algorithm uh, which crawls the university's website and analyzes the content the description of each course and uh, listed on the site. So the algorithm searches for courses and curricula covering climate and environmental sustainability, which corresponds to SDGs 12 to 15. And then when a course or a curricula is identified, it is referenced onto our website, uh, Education for Climate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Thank you. And so uh, here are our results for Belgian universities. So uh, this year, Belgian universities offer a total of 50,000 courses, amongst which less than 3% deal with climate and environmental sustainability. And within these 3%, uh, only one third are fully devoted to these uh, questions. Next slide, please. And um, so, as you know, these courses are then aggregated into curricula, such as baccalaureate, masters, or programs, or other programs. And what we have observed is that only one master or baccalaureate of the six really tackle climate and environmental uh, sustainability. Next slide, please. So now, if you look at the faculties in which you will find these programs, you observe that the majority, 60%, are found in applied sciences. 15% uh, are from economical sciences. Another 15% from social sciences and law, and that health accounts for less than 5%. Uh, next slide, please. So what can we conclude? First, that our algorithm is a powerful tool to analyze and monitor education on climate and environmental sustainability, and also to increase visibility on existing curricula while also highlighting the areas uh, of improvement. Second, that in Belgium at least, the current offering is insufficient to meet with youth, ex youth expectations, to drive innovation and to address the talent acquisition challenges to, to come. And so therefore we advocate for an integration of these topics in as many curricula as possible. And we invite universities to engage into the transition of their curricula. Uh, next slide, please. So I yeah, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, a big thank to CSR Europe for giving us the opportunity to share our work. Please visit our website, educationforclimate.org 
And if you want to reach us, you just have the contact information on the slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Collard. Um, both you and Sergi have said the framework uh, for this panel discussion uh, in the best way possible. We now see clearly that we um, what we are missing is not only um, some education about sustainability, but also a way that businesses and professional um, become certified in the skills um, needed. And I think now we can move on to our panel discussion, which will be moderated by Dr. Alexandre Adonaras. And I now give the floor to Dr. Adonaras. Dr. Adonaras, welcome. Thank you, Ms. Simi. Uh, apologies for, the, uh, for being uh, late to this um, uh, round table. Uh, I think the, the effect of uh, climate change, uh, 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 Francois was talking about it uh, earlier, uh, it, it was uh, an, an, an experience that I have never uh, lived before uh, through it, getting a taxi in Athens uh, while uh, uh, raining uh, heavily. Um, what I would like um, to, to, to say is that um, I totally agree with what Mircini added, uh, that we definitely need uh, more training and education uh, about uh, sustainability and about CSR. Uh, it seems that um, we will need uh, more and more certified training. And IRDO in Slovenia developed uh, one uh, uh, during the last uh, five years. So I would like to start the discussion by asking uh, Mrs. Roskar, uh, what were the reasons uh, that prompted IRDO to develop the Manager for Social Responsibility and Sustainable Development Training Program? Um, hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for the questions. I'm so grateful to be part of this roundtable and that we have opportunity to talk about uh, knowledge on sustainability development, which is so crucial in these times, in this new normal. And what prompted IRDO as a non-governmental research organization um, that is developing social responsibility in Slovenia for last 17 years, with all kinds of different projects. And one of those projects is the Slovenian Horus Award for Social Responsibility. It is running also from uh, 2009. And its mission is to recognize and reward the comprehensive and strategic approaches of um, Slovenian companies and individuals to addressing social responsibility and sustainable development. So all applications for the Horus Award are actually assessed by the independent commission through predefined in-depth questionnaires. And th this was actually a trigger point for starting a new program. Uh, and why, would you ask? Uh, well, companies have to explain and reveal how they manage sustainability and social, um, I mean, social responsibility in, that, in those in-depth questionnaires. So completing those questionnaires has set them a mirror uh, where they can see gaps in knowledge. Uh, so uh, they began to look for, for this knowledge and at IRDA we responded to this need at first with workshops, um, saying how to apply for Horus Award, and later on with the certi certified training program um, for manager for uh, uh, social responsibility and uh, sustainable development. So we started in 2016 with live trainings, and from Corona time zone, things have only been going online. And until now, we certified around 200 managers, experts in Slovenia, that are having some uh, knowledge in sustainable development and social responsibility. And we are trying also to network them so they can exchange some good practices. Uh, so I think we are doing uh, quite a good and important job. Uh, and I must uh, stress out also that last four or five years, as we all know, a lot of things has changed um, the legislation is becoming more mandatory, more binding, and also more concrete. 
And therefore, also new needs for knowledge are already emerging, uh, such as how to prepare different strategies, policies, um, how to set um, uh, some key topics, how to choose the right st standard for reporting and, and the like. So that is why we at IRDA also started a new training program, an advance and upgrade to this manager where participants also get some uh, new knowledge and a certificate uh, with, uh, um, and they, be, they become actually strategists for uh, social responsibility and sustainable development. And we are looking forward to have more and more of them, those educations and trainings. I impressive. Uh, I was uh, impressed with, um, you know, uh, having already trained 200 uh, experienced managers uh, yes. on the topic. And uh, we are lucky to have one of them uh, with us today. So I would like to ask Mrs. Strakulic if you could uh, indicate the main benefits for uh, your company and yourself from uh, completing this uh, IRDOS uh, training. What was uh, that prompted you to sign up uh, for this uh, training? I don't know if, if Mrs. Dracolic is with, with us. Sorry, sorry. Um, I just uh, forgot to unmute myself. Hello to everyone. I'm Martina from Aribor. Um, I'm coming from Hoteliers Cooperative, uh, which consists mostly family-run hotels, which are bonded with the same mindset and hard commitment to work in tourism and interest-based connections. Uh, together, we provide accommodation, the organization of various businesses, sport, catering events, conference halls. And we have started our cooperation with Erdo Institute, uh, which is a leading Slovenian organization that contributes to the development of social responsibility in Slovenia and abroad. Um, with one project two years ago that was called Academy for Social Responsibility for Young People in the Hotel Industry. Uh, we had also joined the Institute as a members. And last year I obtained a certificate manager for social responsibility and sustainable uh, development. And as the employee of the cooperative, I'm uh, very happy uh, that we have conducted uh, internal trainings on the topics of social responsibility for all our members uh, of the cooperative together with the director of IRTO Institute, Anita Hrast. And uh, our cooperative encourage, uh, encourages all our members to acquire sustainable and, and environmental labels because we have a green scheme of Slovenian tourism, which is very good uh, since 2015, and we need uh, these knowledges. This is so true, uh, what you said, and uh, it is uh, always... Um, uh, for us uh, educators, uh, for us academics, it is always uh, great to see how these trainings are appreciated by those that they attend them. So it's, uh, uh, it is very value added to what you uh, just said. Um, I would like now to, to move to another great initiative that uh, uh, I had the honor to participate as a trainer. Uh, it's uh, the, the CSR school, which is organized uh, for three consecutive years now, and it's uh, organized by CSR Elas, uh, the University of Crete and uh, Alba. And then uh, we have um, in our panel, uh, Mr. Nicolas Angelopoulos, uh, whom I would like to uh, thank uh, for his uh, efforts to accommodate me uh, at his uh, uh, main building, because uh, I am uh, right now at the uh, Inter-American uh, office. Uh, and uh, I would like to also thank uh, the, the, the team of uh, CSR Elas for uh, uh, doing something uh, astonishing uh, this day, uh, today, uh, trying to to find um, uh, the best possible solution so that uh, uh, I will reach uh, uh, the the destination or at least uh, a, a place where I can uh, join this uh, uh, roundtable discussion. So I would like to thank both uh, Nicolas and the uh, CSR last team for their efforts, and I would like to ask you, Nicolas, uh, what would you say are the main reasons? professionals in Greece and some uh, professionals from abroad sign up for this program, CSR School? 
Uh, hello to everyone. Hello, Alexander. Um, it's our pleasure uh, under those circumstances that it was really bad for you to do the list and accommodate you to our building. Uh, hopefully, people there they will treat you because I'm at my place. I'm not there to to be to to to, to make the hospitality greater for you. Um, it's my honor to be here in this round table today uh, with these great speakers and with an amazing agenda. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I, um, I've been in that uh, in, in the both sides of the river, if I can say that, because I was uh, a trainee in the CSR school. I was participating as um, showcasing the inter-American uh, case study. And now I'm in from the other side of the river as a member of the board of the CSR LAS, managing the whole uh, CSR school. Um, but what is the CSR school? Actually, is an innovative educational initiative from CSRLAS that is repeated in an annual basis and is actually the first comprehensive educational program on corporate social responsibility and sustainable development. Mm -hmm. It's um, a comprehensive, if you can say, journey uh, through the most relevant and urgent theory, theoretically and practically uh, issues within the scope of uh, CSR. Um, there are many professionals and uh, friends of mine that they want sometimes to change their uh, field of uh, expertise and they asked me what they should do in the CSR. And, you know, I said to them that CSR school is a great start as a, as a newcomer or even if you're into the industry, is really good because it aims to provide advanced training regarding the identification of uh, sustainable related business opportunities and the inclusion actually of responsibility in the core of the business strategy in order to achieve the sustainable value and formulate what we all want, a more resilient organization. But coming to the actual question, uh, Alexandra, you said, why to, why to participate? Actually, at the time that I was speaking, I was questioning myself, why not? You know, it's, um, it's a great program and the trainees are guided through interactive workshops in order to identify the responsibility framework uh, within uh, which the business, uh, they operate, they should operate, and the ways in which the governance can support these things, the restructuring of the strategy, because that's what most of the companies need. Um, moreover, I would like to say that there are case studies um, that people like me that came and they showcased their, uh, uh, the, the, what they did in their organization, and that can show the innovation that can contribute into the enhancement of the sustainable development. Um, actually, there are things that you can... Uh, uh, people are collaborating together, so it's good because you can see that all the stakeholders should be there in order to achieve what we want. Another thing, and last, uh, in order not to get out of my three minutes time, uh, is that you create a network, create a network of uh, valuable people, people of uh, like from young professionals, well-recognized senior professionals, like uh, experts like you, Alexander, from the academic uh, field. So all of that is giving you opportunities in order to network, to meet people, and to see what other people are doing in this. So it, for me, it's like only good things when you participate in this such program. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I must add that uh, the enthusiasm of all participants made it uh, even more excited for, for us who participated uh, as instructors. Uh, and uh, it was a wonderful experience, uh, I'm sure, for, for all of us uh, who participated. Uh, you had the opportunity to participate uh, in the training, uh, but you are also uh, uh, with, with another hat uh, in the side of the organizers. I would like now to, to ask uh, uh, Parmintan Plahe from uh, uh, EIB, from the European Investment Bank, who participated in the school a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2020, and I would like to ask him if, if he can share with us the experience of uh, participating in, in the CSR school. Yes, indeed. Thank you. For, uh, firstly, may I just thank uh, CSR Harris for this opportunity to participate in this, in this panel. And I can just uh, uh, really uh, enforce what Nicholas has already, already alluded to. Uh, I mean, the CSR school 2020 first came to my attention through uh, IMS Luxembourg, which is a net, uh, sustainability network organization here in Luxembourg, which brings together organizations both from public and private sectors in pursuit of sustainability. And in fact, the invitation stemmed from the Greek counterpart of uh, IMS Luxembourg. Uh, and the, I mean, the course itself uh, in 2020 uh, consisted of uh, a 12 sessions spread over six weeks, 
uh, and covered a huge range of uh, topics. I mean, we started with setting the frame, looked at ethical leadership, uh, sustainable value chain creation, responsible governance, uh, sustainable supply chains, the environment, circularity, responsible human resource management, responsible finance and banking, non-financial reporting, responsible investments uh, in capital markets, and last but not least, partnerships for sustainable development. So that gives you a very broad scope. Uh, and as Nicholas said, this is a very uh, good foundation. Now, each session was scheduled for four hours, providing a full 48 hours of training, uh, which was uh, really very comprehensive. Uh, so for me, this seemed like a serious offering. And as a uh, sustainability is a topic that continues to develop <clears throat> at a tremendous pace, uh, I believe it's incumbent on all sustainability professionals to be well informed and educated on the subject. So I thought that this would only add to my knowledge. So uh, that's that's why I, I attended. Now, I've attended many trainings in my time in sustainability, and I have to say that I've learned to curb my expectations of many of these courses because they they tend not to not to deliver what they uh, purport to do. However, in the case of the CSR school, uh, I mean, it more than exceeded any expectations that I had, and it delivered what I considered to be one of the best sustainable tra sustainability trainings I'd had uh, in, in my career. Uh, not only were the presentations on each topic delivered by very distinguished academics and experts through a series of lectures and interactive workshops explaining up-to-date theory and it was, they were supported by well-defined case studies and sharing best practices and probably the most useful was the dialogue and the exchange of ideas and the sharing of the innovative approaches amongst the trainers and the trainees in breakout sessions now, not only did this enhance the learnings, but it also established valuable networking links for trainees to follow up after the, after the training was over. I mean, I still have contacts with several former, former uh, attendees and I continue to do so with, with, and learning from their experiences. Now, it's important to note that uh, the sufficient time was uh, allocated to the breakout sessions to promote proper discussion. Now, I've attended other trainings, as I said before, where the breakout sessions were only just long enough for introductions and no real dialogue was possible. Now, all the presentation materials, including all the pre-reading and the follow-up research resources were made available. Uh, there were even recordings of each session available for a limited period, so you could go back and refresh your memory of the discussions that took place. I must also add that the organization and administration of the whole course was equally exemplary. I mean, from the registration process, right through to the follow-up and delivery of materials, and including, of course, the diploma certificate, which was delivered uh, at the end. I was able to take these learnings and apply them to my sustainability responsibilities at the, at the European Investment Bank and put them into practice in, in, to, to real effect. I mean, overall, I, I think just from my experience, overall, I would, I would say this is one of the best course offerings I've, uh, I've attended. And in, in my humble opinion, this should be made mandatory for all sustainability professionals. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I think the, the organizers of the CSR School uh, should be very pleased with what you said, and perhaps they should use uh, your testimonial as uh, uh, you know promo promotional material uh, for the next one and the ones that uh, will follow. Uh, at this point, we've reached the the end of um, the first uh, uh, panel, uh, and uh, I would like to to point out that uh, I have joined uh, the round table uh, using my. Uh, mobile phone, so I don't have uh, uh, access to to the chat room. So I would like to ask the the CSR uh, Elas um, uh, back office team to to help uh, on uh, the question session. If there are any questions uh, addressed to any of the panelists, uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, um, uh, either Missini or Alexandros to uh, to let to let us know. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dr. Adonaras, there is a question addressed to Ms. Collard uh, by the shifters. Mm -hmm. um, someone from the audience is asking, which courses uh, did high school students or university students identify as uh, the ones best meeting their training um, aspirations regarding environmental issues? Yeah, <clears throat> very, very good question. We actually did not really uh, recall that. So uh, what we have done is really um, an algorithm that enables us to map the, the courses that tackle these issues. Um, we haven't somehow crossed that uh, offering with the expectation of the students. However, we did conduct a survey amongst uh, 600 students 
we did not really specifically ask that question, but we measured the interest in having this kind of education. And it was just so striking uh, that they, they have high expectations up to the point that for some of them, it may even become a um, um, decision criteria when it comes to select the, their universities. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Collard. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I think um, as, a, as a conclusion to this first uh, uh, panel, uh, I think it, it is obvious that all the, the, the latest developments uh, in uh, sustainability, I'm, and I'm referring to the new uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive that will soon be out, uh, uh, which will uh, increase uh, dramatically the number of organizations that will be obliged to uh, disclose uh, information related to sustainability in CSR. Uh, also, uh, the new Sustainable Corporate Governance Directive that will enforce training at the highest level, at the board level, uh, from what we expect, uh, this is going to be a requirement. Also, the, the need for uh, the, the new uh, directive for uh, due diligence of the supply chain <laughs> will, will, will affect uh, uh, the number of organizations uh, uh, even those that will not be uh, uh, obliged to, to, re to, to report. Uh, so there's no doubt that there's going to be a great need for more and more and more training on sustainability and CSR, uh, which justifies the reason why it was uh, discussed uh, uh, today. Now, moving uh, forward to the next uh, panel, to the second panel, uh, uh, which will focus on the role of uh, certification as a stakeholder trust accelerator for promoting sustainability and responsible behavior. Uh, we are uh, all aware of uh, the movements uh, and the, the several frameworks that have been developed uh, at national and uh, European uh, level in order to help organizations uh, to manage uh, sustainability. Uh, as an, uh, an assessor of uh, the European uh, of uh, EFQM uh, excellence model, I was thrilled to, to find out how the new version of the model was influenced by the concept of sustainability. And I'm sure that there are many, many more uh, that um, will, um, will follow. Uh, today, we'll have the opportunity to discuss in this um, uh, roundtable about three great initiatives, two uh, in Slovenia and one in Greece. Um, uh, and, and I would like at this point to, to introduce our panelists. I would like to introduce Mrs. Uh, Lucia Plavic from uh, Egville Bay Institute and uh, Mrs. Uh, Ursula Grozeli uh, from NIL Slovenia, who will talk about the Social Responsible Employer Certification Scheme. Uh, Mrs. Anita Hrast from uh, IRDO Institute and uh, Mr. Jure Brasko from uh, uh, Nova KBM Bank. Slovenia, who will talk about the Horus Award for Social Responsibility, and Mrs. Katerina Katsuli from Grand Forton Las, who will share some insights, insights about the Ethos Certification Scheme. Uh, I'd like to, to, to start uh, uh, with, uh, with the ECVLIC uh, Institute uh, initiative in Slovenia. Uh, uh, Equilib Institute uh, provides company-wide certification services for the uh, socially responsible employers. And I would like to ask Mrs. Glavich, what is it that uh, the social responsible employer scheme actually certifies? Well, thank you uh, for the question and inviting me in this panel. Um, so Certificate Social Responsible Employer is a certificate based on ISO 26000, uh, which is a standard for social responsibility, but is mainly um, focuses on the attitude towards employees. So there are main, uh, main um, four main pillars of the certificates, um, and those are organizational governments, um, health uh, and safety at work, uh, intergenerational cooperation, and reconciliation of professional and private life. Um, at the moment, we have around 130 companies and organizations. Uh, they can also be, for example, non-profitable or public organization uh, in the process of gaining the certificate. Well, there are several reasons why uh, organizations are interested in that certificate. Um, but I would like to point only one, and this is uh, the external expectations. 
so the uh, expectation this also Mr. Uh, Oaki was talking about. For example, uh, the expectations of the clients. Uh, a lot of Slovenian companies are in the middle of the supply chain and their, um, and their um, clients, um, for example, from the Northern uh, Europe or somewhere else, um, are asking those uh, suppliers to, for example, issue the sustainability report or uh, to, to, um, to show the proof how they are uh, socially responsible. Um, there is also an expectation from the legislation that we already heard um, and um, companies that have, for example, our certificate or any other similar certificate uh, can gain uh, additional po po points at public tenders. Um, and then uh, the last, uh, there, um, but not least, uh, there are also expectations from the employees uh, from to, uh, to the companies to be more responsible. For example, the new employees, the new generation of employees maybe are looking uh, to work in the companies that are more responsible, that are taking care of their employees and so on. Um, so with our certificate, we believe that we offer um, education, um, education and we are offering measures to the company to improve their CSR and then sustainability. Um, and that is how they are, they can build trust among their stakeholders. Um, but when we are talking about trust, um, there is of course the trust that um, that is the responsibility of the companies to to to, be, to gain from their stakeholders. But there is also a trust to the certificate methodology and to us, um, Equilib Institute, who are issuing the certificate. So our main job as the um, as Equilib Institute is to have integrity and to have such a certification method methodology um, that can uh, build that trust uh, and help companies um, with that. So, for example, and I will just um, point uh, three main activities that we are doing as Equilib Institute to gain this trust, and those are um, including including stakeholders, especially uh, employees employees of the companies into the, um, into the process of gaining the certificate. Um, the second, there is an independent commission who um, has the final word when issuing the certificate. And um, uh, the least one is external appeal mechanism, uh, which allow uh, employees, um, which, which allow employees of those companies who has um, our certificate to complain uh, directly to us. So to, to have uh, one complaint mechanism um, that is outside of the of the of the organization of the companies. Um, but CSR is a is is a pet. Uh, it's a goal, but also a pet. So of course there are um, there are um, there are a lot of ways to improve our uh, method methodology and um, yes. Um, this is this is what is it uh, with our certificate at the moment. I I must admit that um, uh, I was impressed with uh, what you said about uh, uh, bringing in the in the center of your approach uh, trust trust among uh, uh, stakeholders, including stakeholders in the process. This is so true for all certification programs and all certification schemes. If you don't trust uh, the organization that um, uh, certifies or provides the certificate uh, uh, for their credibility and their approach, uh, then the, the, the certificate itself uh, is not as uh, value added as uh, it, it, it should be. And I, I also would like to comment on, uh, on the pillars uh, you mentioned on the, on the, on the model that um, you have uh, developed. And I was uh, uh, really glad to see that uh, you have Re, you have uh, uh, revealed uh, the importance uh, and the governance uh, uh, dimension as well. Uh, we we have the honor to have with us um, uh, Mr. Ursula Groseli, uh, who actually participated in this. Scheme. So I would like to, to ask, what was that prompted you to become certified by the uh, ECFLIP Institute on uh, this scheme? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I come from NIL uh, company. It is an IT company and uh, we are a part of Konsha uh, group uh, from Denmark. Uh, we are 
a globally recognized provider of advanced data center, network, cloud, and cybersecurity solutions, as well as services for business and industry environments. Uh, we were also one of the first IT companies in Slovenia that obtained the uh, corporate socially uh, responsible uh, employer certificate. But what motivated us to obtain the certificate was the desire to create a, a better working environment and a better environment in general. So we believed that the certification uh, for the field of uh, social responsibility uh, is a necessity and it brings about many positive effects, especially a more visible a reputation, as um, Lucia already mentioned, reputation of the employer, a positive contribution to our customers, partners, and suppliers. So the, uh, uh, the second wish that we had in our mind was to gain uh, uh, a kind of framework of what falls within the scope of social responsibility. So uh, Equilib, uh, and also IRDO Institute, like Simona mentioned before. Uh, I know both of these institutions. We were involved with both. And they were really they giving a great overview and a framework of what falls into the sustainability area. Um, so in this respect, the Equity Institute was very helpful with this. And at this point, I would like to thank them also for their contribution. Uh, last but not least, uh, with all these activities, we want to have positive impact on, um, on the uh, environment and elim eliminate our carbon footprint, footprint in the future, which is uh, a big issue and a big step for all of us that we, we are taking and we still need to do. In doing so, we are definitely following one of our uh, core values, which is embrace sustainable change and positive environmental impact. Most importantly, we are transferring uh, this good practice beyond the borders of Slovenia, which is maybe unusual that we are also educating our colleagues from the group uh, which are uh, only Nordic uh, countries. These are Sweden, Norway, Netherlands and Germany. These are the countries that are in our group and we are transferring now good practices to them. Um, we will continuously to strive to induce sustainable strategies into our business, that is for sure. Um, before um, I conclude, I would really stress out the importance of education and certification. Uh, and as I already mentioned, IRDO and Equilib are doing a great job and also the rest of you that you presented today, your uh, experiences. So about all, we will strive to, to for IT, for a better life, which is also our motto. So thank you. And uh, I'll be happy to connect with you also via LinkedIn if you have any questions, any good practices so we can share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think you justified uh, very clearly why an organization uh, should uh, you know, follow this uh, uh, certification scheme. Um, and um, now I'd like to move to um, another uh, scheme. Uh, IRDO launched uh, in uh, 2017 the Horus Award for Social Responsibility, uh, a scheme that has very strict and detailed application and evaluation uh, processes, quite like the ones of an actual uh, management certification scheme. So I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Harst, uh, as organizers of this award scheme, could you briefly indicate what it takes for a company to be awarded the Horus Award? In other words, how difficult or simple is it? Thank you very much, and I'm glad and honored that I can be with you today. It's a great round table. Uh, I'm coming from IRDO Institute for the Development of Social Responsibility. We are delivering this Horus Award for 13 years already. So now it's the call open for Slovenian Social Responsibility Award Horus 2021. 
and uh, our uh, delivering of the award will be on December 10th. So you are kindly invited to join us. So why this award? We have found out that we need something for our companies already 13 years ago in Slovenia, uh, which will help them to uh, have strategic approach to social responsibility and sustainability. And like Simona already mentioned, and other colleagues too, we started with um, uh, raising awareness among companies, but also civil society and um, government, how to achieve these uh, targets, like now are also delivered through uh, sustainable development goals and others. So uh, how to achieve our award? It's not so easy, like <laughs> uh, candidates say. Um, for them, awards, we have many of awarding um, categories. Uh, for them, can apply businesses, institutions, non-profit and other organizations, local communities, public law entities, journalists and also individuals, if all of them are acting socially responsible manner. So we reward uh, the comprehensive approaches of those entities uh, to social responsibility and sustainable development. And uh, there are two main categories. First is award for integral strategic approach of a legal entity. And the second is recognition for the project. But we have also two special calls for recognitions. And one is for individual who is working a lot on the field of social responsibility and a special award for journalists. Um, so uh, if uh, one who is candidate for our award uh, would like to apply, he has to fill out, fill out um, the specialized questionnaire. And this questionnaire is harmonized with the guidelines of the standard for social responsibility, ISO 26000, and other current documents on social responsibility and sustainability, which are available on the global, EU, or national level. So um, if they fill out this questionnaire, then they can uh, also analyze, self-analyze their own strategy on the topic of social responsibility and sustainability in their organization, and they can renew their own strategy. So they can easily also report um, to the public what they are doing uh, within the strategic approach uh, in their uh, legal entity. So uh, we are not rewarding only one topic of social responsibility, but uh, all seven core themes and principles from uh, standard for social responsibility. And we hope that in the future, like we see now, the changes of um, uh, legislation on European level will be everything more easily to be um, to be uh, to report within our questionnaire and other uh, uh, needed uh, um, actions. So uh, we are delivering this award with many uh, partner organizations like Public Relations Association, American Chamber of Commerce, uh, Institute for Information, Cooperation and Development of Non-Governmental Organizations, Marketing Association of Slovenia, Managers Association, Chamber of Commerce and other organizations. So um, I hope that in the future there will be much more than 200 awardees that are already within our networking group. And um, I'm looking forward to see many more of them uh, educating, uh, uh, analyzing their strategies and um, raising awareness with their role modeling uh, in the future too. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I have a question, but I will uh, uh, ask you later uh, in the Q and A session. Um, at, at this point, we can go a deep, um, a, a bit further uh, to see how this Oros Award uh, is actually uh, uh, appreciated and perceived by organizations that they actually. Uh, Managed to to get this reward. So we have with us uh, Mr. Jure Bratsko uh, from uh, uh, KBM uh, Bank in Slovenia, Nova KBM Bank. And I would like to ask, uh, what what was uh, the, uh, the 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 strategy uh, of the bank that enabled you to uh, uh, to win this uh, 
uh, Horns Award in 2020. And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it was for uh, the strategic management approach uh, regarding social responsibility. Yes, uh, correct. Um, first of all, maybe just to clarify, the Nova KBM is a bank with 2,000 employees. It's The balance sheet is around 10 billion and it's owned by the private equity fund and the European Bank for uh, Reconstruction and Development. And to gain this, it took uh, quite some time. Uh, Nova KBM, uh, the bank, uh, have always been committed to the corporate social responsibility hour Motivation is very simple. We are a responsible bank, which builds uh, sustainable relationships with our stakeholders and wants to leave a better legacy for future generations, uh, means we want to be part of the solution. Uh, for us, uh, CSR uh, encompasses our focus to build sustainable uh, relations with stakeholders um, our focus is on the long-term development of the broader social welfare and, of course, to the preservation of the natural environment. But importantly, uh, since mo most of you know that how banks are regulated, that CSR is also a self-regulatory mechanism that not only ensures the bank's compliance with applicable regulations, ethical rules, and also standards, but much more than this. Um, what's important in the future and already uh, also in the past is that these areas of uh, sustainability and responsibility are evolving rapidly. So we see CSR, SDG and um, what's known the main framework, ESG, these three concepts as complementary. And in Nova KBM, CSR is part of, co of comprehensive ESG, uh, means environmental, social, and governance strategy. And it's focused on all aspects in, in our business. Um, banks' wide ESG transformation program uh, that puts this agenda among our priorities. And to govern the implementation of the strategy, uh, the bank formed uh, it's called Climate Change and Sustainability Committee. In this committee, all management board members are present and um, they take accountability and ownership of specific areas along other members of the committee. These are mainly the executive directors, which are most active on the ESG uh, front. And the mission of this uh, committee is to ensure comprehensive implementation of the ESG strategy across the entire organization and make the most out of the potential opportunities arising uh, from the ESG uh, transformation. We see also the opportunities to create the revenue. Um, within CSR strategy, huge focus is also on measuring the progress and reporting. So every year we, uh, since 2017, we have been publishing, uh, besides the business report, also, of course, the corporate responsibility and sustainability report, which includes different GRE and some ESG uh, principles. And of course, this is publicly available. So um, to conclude, uh, we are today proud to receive this uh, sustainable, heavy uh, Horus Award for Social Responsibility. Uh, and this confirms the integrity of our sustainable development uh, management and, of course, also encourages us um, uh, to keep developing sustainable corporate governance uh, in the future. It's also very important that all C-suite uh, finds this award very important because that also um, um, help us, uh, the executive directors and also all other that are on the ESG front, that we continue our CSR journey with confidence, knowledge and the optimism and that the bank, uh, the Nova KBM, and I think also all the other banks in the future, should be part of the solution, uh, especially um, playing the key roles in economic uh, recovery following uh, the current pandemic. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with you, uh, you read that um, uh, organizations like yours needs to be uh, need to be part of the of the solution, uh, and they need to. Um, uh, invite others to follow 
And I think financial institutions like yours uh, will have to play a key role uh, in the years to come uh, if we if we are to achieve uh, this uh, uh, sustainability change, as um, uh, Ursula mentioned earlier, uh, that we all need. Um, thank you, thank you, Jure. And um, I would like now to uh, go to another scheme uh, that was. Uh, uh, developed uh, in uh, Greece, CSRLAS has developed uh, the Ethos Certification Scheme. And we have with us uh, uh, Mrs. Katerina Katsouli, uh, member of the board of CSR, LAS. Uh, and I would like to ask her if uh, you can share some of the details about the, the scheme and what it makes it an innovative uh, initiative. Hello, good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, present or explain some features of this uh, uh, very interesting tool. We have seen that the certification for sustainable and responsible behavior is a very strong stakeholder trust accelerator, as it is uh, the name of uh, the roundtable today because stakeholder engagement is, is so rapidly increasing in importance to support companies in, successful, in successfully conducting their businesses and contributing to the sustainable development goals. Um, furthermore, by introducing social responsibility criteria, ethical management and transparency, the companies can become more competitive, reduce risk and improve management practices. Uh, to that end, Ethos, that is the name of the tool, is a certification scheme based on the United Nations general principles and objectives for sustainable development and includes requirements for responsible and sustainable entrepreneurship across the range of business activities. Successful assessment by qualified auditors leads to the award of the Social Responsibility uh, Report Assurance, let's say, the, it is called ethos. And that demonstrates the practical implementation of principles of human rights, environmental protection, ethical and responsible governance, um, showing that the company um, produces shared value in a responsible way. Um, it is, uh, let's say, a very innovative uh, framework. Uh, it has been um, developed uh, uh, from CSRLAS in partnership with a member company, Eurocert, uh, which operates in the field of providing assurance and certification services. So it was the right partnership, let's say, to that specific tool. It is uh, the first Greek model that covers a broad range of corporate parameters that are related to compliance with the current regulatory framework, but also to um, governance, economic sustainability, as well as uh, the management of the impact of business activities on the society and the environment. It also relates to crisis management and the system of prevention um, that the company uh, is implementing, striving to ensure corporate sustainability. Um, the basic principle of ethos has to do with human rights, uh, employee rights, quality of customer service, health and safety, uh, um, environment, protection of the environment, fighting corruption and anti-bribery actions, and of course supporting the local communities. The certification procedure, let's say it's very close to management certification procedure. And as soon as uh, the company uh, is organized on these specific areas, it is very, let's say, easy to be certified uh, as a responsible uh, operating company. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, I, I must say that um, uh, you mentioned the, uh, that the, the model was organized, the, the, yeah, the, the standard was uh, developed by a partnership 
And this is why that I would like to highlight the importance of partnerships in this effort. We are all together in this journey and we need to uh, help each other. And from what you said, uh, this uh, seems to be a holistic uh, standard, a holistic uh, How is it to be applied by a small organization? Because a large organization that has the structures and the, the resources, perhaps it's mm -hmm. easy, but how about a small organization? Yes, I, I forgot to mention that it is uh, designed in order to be easy also for small organization. It's not just like um, a certification according to ISO 26000 that is more difficult, uh, broader, let's say. That is a certification uh, tailor-made to SMEs, I would say. Mm. Okay, this is very this is very important because uh, we are lacking about uh, we are lacking this kind of uh, tools to help SMEs because uh, the, the the change will uh, happen if we motivate the small organizations as well and it, it's uh, it's very very important to to hear this. Um, That's it, why it, we believe it is really innovative. <laughs> yeah, is it available in uh, in Greek only or uh, in English as well? It is also available in English as well. <laughs> okay, this is great. And the, the, the same question goes to um, also um, uh, Lucija and uh, Anita about the other frameworks that were presented. If they are available only in Slovenian or if, if, if they're publicly available, first of all, and if it's uh, possible to to find it in in English as well. So I don't know uh, uh, if uh, Lucija wants to comment or Anita. Uh, let's go first to to Lucija. Thank you for the question. Uh, well, our certificate is a very new uh, certificate and is uh, at the moment only meant for the Slovenian companies because they are um, we are financing uh, ourselves from the uh, European funds. Uh, but in the future, we are already developing an English uh, version and we we. Our goal is also to um, to go to, to other countries with that certificate. Yeah, through, through partnerships. <laughs> yes. Through, through the appropriate partnerships. Okay, <laughs> I, I Thank you very much for question. Um, yes, we translated our questionnaire already in English, but we didn't publish it public uh, because we would like to find partners uh, through Europe if someone is interested to go in partnership with us. We would like to deliver our knowledge uh, to other uh, uh, countries, but I know that each country already has uh, some um, sustainable or social responsible award and maybe it's time to create an European level award on strategic approach and new renewed business models. Um, in, in accordance to new legislation that, and the European Green Deal and other changes that we have to do all in our business. So, so it would be great to collaborate. <laughs> yeah, so th this is what I was going to, to comment. Uh, it seems that there is uh, a, a quite of a, a potential for uh, collaborations among uh, networks uh, in Europe on these topics and uh, perhaps some good ideas for uh, future projects. Um, uh, at this point, I would like to ask uh, the back office team uh, at CSR Las uh, Mircini, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, indeed. We do have one question uh, addressed to Mr. Bratko. Um, um, someone from the audience is asking if Mr. Bratko could provide um, uh, some KPIs uh, that the bank is using to measure the progress uh, of their uh, ESG strategy. Yes, uh, we are um, we are having uh, several key P, uh, KPIs um, in uh, inside the ESG framework. But of course, um, I didn't mention this um, in the past. We focus on uh, GRE. Uh, reporting, so uh, global reporting initiatives. So in the past, these were uh, some of our um, uh, KPIs, let's call it this way. And inside the ESG, we focus separately on the environmental, social and governance with 
um, maybe for environmental, this uh, social, uh, the sorry, the carbon footprint is very uh, popular topic. And to be very specific, we do measure, we do measure everything, how much um, energy was um, uh, consumed and that kind of things. Uh, so we do report uh, how much we decrease uh, the energy consumption. Um, at the second, that it's also very interesting. I don't know where this uh, question came from, but for example, the usage of paper. Our one of the main goals is to do the paperless paperless banking. Uh, of course, we want to digitalize uh, many of the processes in the back end uh, system and, of course, in the front end. So today, the um, the contracts are signed um, digitally. But uh, uh, if you imagine, a lot of times people during their work, they have to print the papers. So what we did in 2000, uh, end of 2018, I believe it was, um, when you go to the printer and you um, um, uh, log in yourself to the printer, you, have, uh, you see that you are logged in and we measure the printing of the paper per the individual and each unit head once per month actually gets the report of the printing. Uh, so um, at the beginning, this was very interesting because some of the people were a little bit reluctant. For some of the people, it was weird. But at some point, it's just like the mindset, the changing the mindset, the culture. And then you just get used to it. You are always reminded when you log into the printer uh, that you are printing and you uh, even, it's not just that uh, we know who is printing, uh, we are not taking any negative action, uh, but we know who is printing and at the same time on the screen, if you print 10 pieces of paper, you see the cost of it. Um, so this is like some culture changes, but uh, we do measure a lot and we want to, we believe that it's uh, possible to measure almost everything. So there are some KPIs, this logical one with the carbon footprint, but also the usage of the paper. And I don't know the number by the head now, but uh, when we measure the, um, how much paper did we reduce, we are talking about, I don't know, 500 trees per year and something like that. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, we need to have uh, measurements because you cannot change or you cannot manage something unless you measure it. Uh, so it's, it's important. And uh, in this journey, uh, the sustainability journey, uh, we need to find the, the best possible way to, way to measure uh, uh, the, the impact, to measure uh, the, uh, the results we are achieving uh, and or to have at least some indication of where we are compared to where we need to go. Um, Mr. Adonaras, um, yeah. do you think we have the time for a final question from the audience? Yes, yes we, we have, yeah. This one is addressed to Ms. Hrast um, regarding the Horus Award Scheme. Um, do you have um, RSMEs also included in the Horus Award Scheme? And if yes, could you give us some information about how many SMEs apply, um, how many have been awarded, and so on? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, um, SMEs are all the time together involved in this competition. Uh, they also prepare their strategic approaches uh, to social responsibility and sustainability. Each year, there are at least few of them uh, within the competition. And I cannot give you the, the exact number, but you can see everything on our webpage, uh, uh, horus.si. And there are over this uh, listed and presented all the finalists. The finalists who collect uh, at least 51% uh, uh, of scores, uh, total scores, they, they can apply for uh, awards. Uh, and become also recognized with uh, special um, recognition that they became finalists. So yes, it is for small and um, middle companies very interesting scheme. And sometimes also happens that uh, were more um, SMEs included in the competition 
than uh, large companies. So uh, it depends on the year and it depends on the ma maturity of the company who apply, if they will apply or not. And on, also on the values of, of the head of the company. You know. If they understand the social responsibility and sustainability concept well, then they apply. Uh, within the company, but if the top management has no attitude to the topics, then we cannot get any <laughs> application from such a company. So I think in the future, SMEs will be maybe most important companies for raising awareness on the topic. Thank you. Jure would like to add something, so I would like to uh, give the floor to, to Jure. Um, yeah, maybe because the, the uh, discussion is uh, developing, um, if there are like uh, between the audience any marketing or sustainability directors or communication directors in, uh, let's uh, say, SMEs or corporates, um, uh, in marketing, we often, um, when we are doing with retail with clients, you often see the challenges um, um, and figure out, you know, people in generally, uh, are reluctant to changes. So you, whatever you are selling, people are reluctant to changes. And I, t I see CSR or the ESG uh, as a broader uh, concept, very important. If you uh, find it, if you look at it in a positive way, and despite it means also reporting, um, and it's hard to adopt it inside the organization, but ESG uh, and uh, sustainability in general are great opportunity for all big organizations to see it as a positive way. If you try uh, measure it properly, that you start to implement changes that uh, people are reluctant to, but you can create a very great PR stories out of it. You know, you can uh, digitalize your um, approach toward the clients and you say we are saving uh, trees. Uh, you can implement other things that are not popular uh, among the clients and uh, on the retail segment, maybe even corporate, and you can find the story inside the sustainability. So you can uh, change this story into something positive and actually uh, reduce the cost side uh, on one side inside the companies and, of course, also increase uh, the revenue uh, part of the company if you know how to handle the sustainability inside the company. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, now, as a, as a concluding um, remark, um, I would like to, to share with you some uh, key words that I put down on the paper while listening to our speakers of uh, all panels. Uh, trust, uh, ethical management, governance, transparency, partnerships, uh, certification, obviously, and training. Uh, these are uh, words that uh, show what needs to happen, what needs to be achieved uh, in order to manage, uh, to uh, achieve the uh, sustainability changes that will uh, enable us to uh, uh, reach uh, some of the goals that we have uh, set. Uh, as Europe, as a uh, uh, global community. Uh, and the, the role of training and education is uh, very, very important. Uh, I'm, I'm, skip, I'm talking as uh, an academic uh, uh, that um, we have responsibility uh, to, to help in this transition, in this change. Perhaps universities need to uh, change their curricula to include these terms in every single course, not, uh, not having just one single course on sustainability or CSR, perhaps we need to redesign curricula. Um, I would like to thank all of you, all the panelists and speakers, uh, the organizers uh, for this opportunity, all of you who were uh, watching us. Uh, I would like to thank um, again uh, once more uh, uh, Nicolas Angelopoulos uh, for the efforts and uh, Alexandros Kostopoulos and Mersini uh, for uh, the uh, their work, uh, hard work to make this uh, uh, round table uh, happen. Uh, my biggest fear when we started uh, a few months ago was uh, managing time. It seems that we are just on time. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you once again. 
and wish you a pleasant evening. Good night, everyone.